discuss. So Matt, Matt and Mike, you guys are up. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so this is the review of the week uh, for the dates of February 11th through February 15th. Um, so on tonight's agenda, uh, we're gonna first, uh, next slide please. So we're gonna first be discussing uh, the major events for the week. And then we're gonna take a look at how the markets did. And then we'll finish off with what's in store for us in the next coming weeks. All right, so if you move on to the next slide. So looking at the, the major events, I did want to quickly touch on some of the items that we've been talking about and we'll probably continue to monitor in the next coming weeks. Uh, and I also wanted to touch on some of the other um, noteworthy items that I found uh, to be particularly interesting. So starting with the border crisis, um, and, and along with this, the government shut down. Last week, the House and the Senate both voted to approve a spending deal to avert another shutdown. Uh, so in doing so, Congress allocated roughly $1.4 in funding for the wall. Uh, so this was far short of uh, Trump's original demand of $5.7 billion. Uh, he did sign the bill, but then he did issue a national emergency declaration in which he plans to take funding from uh, the military construction funding program, uh, defense department programs, and the treasury forfeiture funding uh, to uh, obtain the additional funding that he requires. Uh, so what's to come out of this? What to look out for in the next coming weeks? Uh, by Trump's own expectations, this decision was likely to face pushback and uh, legal battles, not just from Congress, but from bordering states, uh, landowners, and other parties. And it looks like that's already happening. Uh, multiple states have already issued lawsuits to stop that declaration. So we'll continue to monitor that and see how that plays out. Um, I did want to next talk about the trade war with China and provide some quick updates there. Um, so in terms of the negotiations, uh, last week US officials did state that progress was being made. Um, there are some sticking points that remain to be discussed, um, some particularly uh, in uh, how intellectual property and trade secrets will be handled. Um, Trump has, however, hinted that if the two sides are uh, reaching a deal that he may push back on the original March 1st deadline. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that uh, as discussions continue in Washington this week. Next slide, please. All right, so continuing with the China theme, uh, I wanted to talk about a story that I found to be really interesting. It centers around the China Minsheng Investment Group, or CMIG. Um, has anyone actually ever heard of CMIG before? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So prior to last week, I, haven't, I hadn't heard of them either. Uh, CMIG is one of the largest investment groups, private in investment groups in China. Um, so they're, although they're relatively new, I believe less than five years old, uh, the co-founder has compared them saying that they were basically China's version of JP Morgan. Uh, so since they began operations in 2014, the company has spent more than $4 billion on investments and amassed roughly $34 billion in debt. So why am I talking about this now? Uh, China's economy has been slowing. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been some increased pressures in controlling leverage, so less borrowing. Uh, and this is bad news for companies like CMIG. Uh, so on Monday, the 11th, uh, they actually missed one of their bond payments. And the Chinese economy as a whole has really experienced a surge in corporate bond defaults, uh, especially last year. So banks and lender confidence in the Chinese economy is um, is eroding uh, as uh, Beijing is limiting liquidity to reduce a systematic risk uh, or avoid systematic risk. And on top of that, you've got the ongoing trade negotiations with the US. Um, so I found this to be particularly interesting. It speaks to a lot of the struggles that the Chinese economy is facing at this moment. Um, to put this into perspective, if you were a bondholder of JP Morgan and they missed one of their payments that's due to you, um, I would think that you would lose confidence in the economy uh, and start reducing your investment. 
Oh, really wow. good story, Mike. It's it's sort of a precursor to what's going on in the Chinese economy. So we've seen we've heard that the economy is slowing down. We've seen some evidence of it, but missing a bond payment is big, especially in China, where banks are involved with the company. This doesn't happen very often. This is a really good story. Yeah, yeah. I was actually a little surprised because I didn't see too many headlines on this. Um, I kind of would have expected more, uh, especially being that this is one of their largest private investment banks. But um, yeah, I was, I was lucky to find this one. Um, all right, so moving on to our last story, uh, which is, of course, the Amazon debacle. So this whole episode with Amazon has been uh, like watching a reality show. It, it's been a long process, a lot of bidding, anticipation. Finally, Amazon chooses Long Island City as one of their headquarters. And as you may know, last week, that deal fell apart. Uh, so Amazon pulled out of that deal. Um, they've stated that this has come out of uh, opposition from politicians uh, and residents alike. Uh, so now it's a matter of who's to blame. Um, some are blaming the New York Congresswoman for missing the opportunity. Um, on the other hand, she, from the very beginning, has criticized this deal, saying that this is a billion dollar company and it's receiving significant tax breaks and that's not really something that's in the interest of the uh, communities. So I wanted to hear from you guys as to what you think about this. Um, do you feel as if this is a missed opportunity for Long Island City, or is this a stance against corporate greed? Any thoughts? I think it's an opportunity they missed out on. This is Nick. Okay, thanks, Nick. Any reason why you may may go that route? I, I think it would have brought in a lot of, I guess, high earning jobs, like median income and above, and a lot of work to that area. And I think, um, especially now with the pressure on like the state and local income tax, credit might be going away or it's limited to like $10,000, like high tax places like New York City. Um, I guess it's going to be more competitive to keep people staying in their state. And that could have been something that actually brought people to New York City. I, I believe this area. is, sorry, this is TJ. Sorry. Do you guys hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. I was supposed to raise the hand, but I didn't find the button there. My, okay. uh, my thought process is that they dumped in, uh, New York, Long Island because diversification of population, uh, Nothing against anyone, but I believe that there's not enough a young population in Long Island area as compared to Arlington area. And I believe that Amazon is more into uh, capturing a young crowd. Uh, young, when I'm talking about young, that means that not well experienced. They want to groom the beginner and uh, give them more opportunity. And that's, that's one reason Amazon dump uh, but I believe that Amazon dumped the New York City, Long Island area. Okay. Anyone else have any thoughts? I see Adam's hand is raised. Yep. Um, I think it's, uh, it was a poor decision. I mean, obviously, it's not ideal. And I think from a, uh, a U.S. citizen perspective, I would want Amazon to pay taxes. But at the same point, from a micro perspective of my community, I would want that many jobs, um, would want the incomes to go up by that much because then local businesses will be affected when it comes to more general um, cash and money in the general area. So I think they missed out on a great opportunity. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts before we move on? What are, you, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I, I personally think it's, it's more of a missed opportunity. Um, you know, Long Island City is not a very, it, it's a poor city. So I felt like this could bring a lot of development to the city. Um, I understand from certain residents' point of view that this may push them out to other areas. Um, but um, the, I felt like the, opportunity in jobs, creating new jobs and uh, bettering the, the community um, outweighed the uh, tax benefits that um, New York City would have had to incur or 
um, let Amazon get away with. Um, so I feel I, I side more so on the uh, missed opportunity side of things. Yeah, uh, TJ, I, I don't agree with your comment. I think Amazon was very particular on where they situated. They situated in, in Virginia because they wanted the, the um, access to DC, but they also wanted the defense contractor kind of business. Uh, they, they're looking for that business to be heavy tech. Whereas in New York, they were looking for the creative advertising space. And so they were targeting uh, advertising, creative marketing kind of people that are already congregating in New York. And I don't think it had to do with the fact that Long Island is, um, is an ethnically poor, or I'm sorry, is a, is a um, lower wealth area. Their belief was that they could help improve the economy there. I think, I, I also agree it was a missed opportunity. I think we, uh, I think cities use tax incentives to attract business. And the numbers I've seen pretty consistently is for every 1 billion that Amazon was going to receive in tax benefits, the community was going to receive 9 billion. So the economic impact of the area is huge. And there's always a concern about gentrification and um, relocating populations. Hopkins got hit for that hard in, um, in Baltimore at different points in time. And so I think communities have to be really cautious about uh, how they go about development. But it's not just the Amazon jobs, it's the diner that springs up and the employees and, and the sanitation workers and the gyms that open up to support all these employees. The, the economic impact of providing tax incentives are well documented to be quite beneficial. Now, Amazon wasn't helped by this week. There was a story that came out that had, they had uh, I think it was 51 billion in profit and they didn't pay any tax. Not good, Amazon. Um, uh, so that that certainly didn't help. But this is really costly to New York City, and and I think those politicians are going to find themselves with some difficulty come re-election time. Uh, I think Amazon has most definitely pointed fingers, and uh, uh, it, it will be certainly used against those politicians when they go up for re-election. Okay, so I'll pass it off to Matthew now to take us through the markets. All right, thanks, Mike. So another good week in the markets. Um, before I look at the three indices, I want to touch on some of the main reasons that there were gains across the board. Um, I know this was just discussed by Mike, but it appears that one of the main reasons for consistent gains in the stock market is due to progress with the trade negotiations with China. Um, this could potentially open up the export markets to give us the ability to trade more with China, which in turn will naturally have a positive impact on the U.S. economy. Another reason I feel like the market is staying positive is just due to general economic good news. Um, consumer confidence is near an all-time high, and the job picture is looking bright. In earnings reports that are coming out now for, oh, you can stay on that slide, I'm sorry, I want to get down here. Um, in earnings reports that are now coming out for December 2018, much of the larger companies are beating their earnings estimates, which is a sign of solid earnings, which normally leads to an increase in stock prices. And finally, like I said, jobs continue to have solid gains while unemployment is still at a historic low. So looking at the Dow here, um, week ending February 15th, it grew 2.49% over the week. This marks the eighth straight weekly gain um, one thing I wanted to point out is that this is a broad base increase, whereas we learned, I think it was a couple classes ago, um, sometimes one or two companies can strongly influence the Dow positively or negatively. Um, this doesn't appear to be the case. It looks like it's general positive growth across the board. Um, if you want to switch to the next slide, we can look at the S&P. This grew 2.4% last week. Um, just one thing I wanted to point, here, point out here about the S&P is that since it was on a low in the year on December 24th, it has risen 18%, which is a huge growth um, in that seven week span. So if you wanna go to the next slide, finally, looking at the NASDAQ, that was a 2.2% gain for the week. Um, this is the lowest gain of the three indices. And I think that's mainly due to FANG, which I think we know is the acronym for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Facebook has the security issues. And I think overall, um, these companies can be a little more volatile. So we'll see what they do from here. Um, if you go to the next slide, I just want to touch on reasons for concern with the markets. 
because everything's been positive, but there are a few reasons of concern. Majority of our economy is driven by retail sales. There's a little bit of indication that some retail sales are not as strong as anticipated uh, this past holiday season. So it is something that we want to look at. Um, another issue could just be like we talked about the trade deal with China falling apart. Uh, both countries are aggressive with their trading stance. And all, although things appear to look favorable now, uh, there's a chance that they might not be able to work out through, uh, their differences because of the, how aggressive each one of them are. Uh, finally, I just wanted to make one little point on this fundamentals uh, bullet point. So there's been a push to change some of the fundamentals in our economy in regards to capitalism. And the market appears to be discounting that right now. However, if things were to gain more traction with this talk, um, it'd be interesting to see where our, um, where the markets would go with news of this. So that's all I have. You want to pass it to Matt? Hey, thanks. Um, so looking forward at the week to come, um, go over a couple um, foreign policy events, um, some GDP announcements from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and uh, earning announcements uh, next. So again, the um, China USA trade talks that are uh, scheduled to take place already discussed that for the most part. Um, just a couple of things to add. Um, some, some of the important issues still haven't gotten any resolution. For example, um, Chinese Yuan fluctuation because they tend to um, play around with it and they devalue it um, to try and deal with, especially in the face of uh, US tariffs. Um, oh, there was also a report that came out recently that uh, the, the tariffs that the US um, imposed earlier um, back in, I guess 2017 at this point, uh, may have spurred increased Chinese cyber uh, warfare and intrusions. And um, right now, don't know if that's going to get resolved um, at the talks, um, whether they um, finish by one March or whether they push it to uh, beyond that. Because right now, if, if they don't make the March deadline, then tariffs on those Chinese goods, about $200 billion worth are going to jump from 10 to 25%. Um, also this coming up, uh, the other one, sorry, <laughs> the other um, foreign policy event coming up is the uh, Hanoi summit uh, between North Korea and the United States. This is the second meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. Their first meeting was uh, back on uh, 12 June 2018. You might remember that Trump once mocked Kim Jong-un with the moniker Rocket Man and threatened fire and fury. Um, North Korea, for its part, um, has suspended nuclear and missile tests, but there are reports that it is still pursuing um, a program of nuclear weaponization. Um, and their main goal is to get the U.S. to lift economic sanctions. Um, they've had a they've had a rough go of it, especially with um, the Kaesong Industrial Zone. Uh, that was shut down back in 2016, um, and that that employed 53,000 uh, North Korean workers and generated about 90 million dollars a year uh, for uh, North Korea in hard currency. Um, anybody anybody have any thoughts on either of these two events? Um, this is Kenneth Jung. Hey. So I think that. For the for the tri President Trump and Kim Jong Un to meet, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, you know, who knows how effective it will be, but I do believe that um, you know, for um, for just peace overall, and to maybe you know change things because times have kind of been you know, tough for everyone, right? For China and all the other stakeholders involved. Um, so hopefully, you know, this is the right move to make, but I do certainly believe that it is a positive step. Anybody else? I don't see any hands raised or anybody chiming in. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, close that. All right, GDP announcements. So um, Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, they had to delay some GDP announcements uh, due to the government shutdown. So this coming up week, there'll be uh, GDP by state for third quarter 2018. Um, previous quarter 2018, um, tw uh, second quarter 2018, uh, Texas was the fastest growing, 6% uh, growth. Um, across, across the nation, um, industries that were really um, that were really contributing to growth were information services, real estate, rental and leasing, um, professional, scientific, and technical services. Uh, information services, in particular, was up thirteen point four percent. So, re really, you can see that the service, like services in the service economy, is really uh, driving um, a large part of the. Um, the economic sector, durable goods manufacturing uh, was also was also up. Um, mining and agriculture, uh, forestry, fishing, and hunting was up, um, and that was um, that was up eight point five percent. It had actually declined in the first quarter, twenty eighteen. So, so what we'll we'll see what comes out for this for this third quarter, and then at the end of the month. Um, you have the initial look at the at GD, at national GDP for fourth quarter uh, 2018 and for the calendar year. So the previous quarter, third quarter 2018, 3.4%. Uh, Quarterly growth in uh, for the U.S. has been greater than 1% since the end of 2015, and we have not had um, a single quarter of negative growth since 2009. Um, again, um, I'm opening it up to uh, comments or observations from anyone. Thought I saw a hand. TJ. Yeah, my, my question is, you said Texas is always at the high level, right? Where the Maryland state, Maryland state stands? Um, I found that Maryland had not, I don't know how we can say that Maryland uh, domestic growth rate as compared to other, other states, especially Texas. Um, I'd have to pull up the data. <laughs> No, no worries, but I, I'm just wondering because we don't, I don't know what we have to compare with, with other big states. Right, I, I got you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have that data right at my fingertips. I'd have to, I'd really have to like. Um... In general, Maryland has pretty high growth rate. It's a highly educated population and we have proximity to DC. Uh, the uh, all of the Columbia activity around cybersecurity is a, is a big growth uh, vehicle for us, and all of the government uh, that is in in Maryland. So, in general, our growth rate tends to be uh, quite high. Yeah, twenty second uh, the previous quarter, it's looked like uh, three point six percent. Um, so, kind of actually fairly middling, um, all things considered. Thank you. Yep. All right, and uh, the last one that I've got, uh, earnings announcements. So these are just um, five companies that have a pretty high um, market capitalization that all are doing earning, and earning announcements um, this upcoming week. So I, I thought that was interesting to look at. So the first one, Home Depot, um, uh, they, they've got an earning announcement uh, coming out uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, uh, 26 February. So their mar their market capitalization is 213 billion. Uh, the previous um, EPS was a dollar 69. The projection is two dollars and 16 cents. Also this week, uh, Lowe's is doing their earnings announcement. So you've got both of these um, companies that do a lot with um, home like home home repair and all that stuff. Uh, doing their earnings this this week. FEMSA, does anybody know what FEMSA is? That's a no. Anybody else? No. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of no's. So it yeah, may surprise you to learn that FEMSA is the largest independent bottler of Coca-Cola in the world. <laughs> 
So, um, they, yeah, so 3.8 billion unit cases per year. Um, they also own the largest chain of convenience stores in Mexico, um, OXO, and they, um, and just last month they had an eight to one uh, stock split. So it'll be interesting uh, to see what their, um, what their um, earnings report is. AB InBev, um, th this one's pretty well known. Um, Anheuser-Busch and, and all them, uh, let's see. So they, they recently partnered with uh, Tilray, which is a Canadian cannabis company uh, to research uh, cannabis infused non-alcoholic drinks. That was in December. And they recently purchased uh, Cutwater Spirits, uh, which was started by the guys who did um, Ballast Point Brewing. So this is twice now that the uh, founders um, the, uh, that, um, of Ballast Point have built up a company and then sold it off. Um, they, they, uh, Ballast Point is currently owned by Constellation um, and now AB and Bev owns uh, Cutwater Spirits. Uh, TJX, um, this probably, um, somebody, somebody out there probably knows what this is. I saw a hand, Tyler. Yeah, is that um, TJ Maxx? Yep, it's TJ Maxx and Marshalls and like a couple other, other companies that um, do that. So um, the, the, discount, um, the discount retail. Um, seasonally adjusted retail fell 1.2% uh, in December, but clothing and accessories actually had growth 4.7%. So um, actually there should be good, um, a good earnings report from TJX. All right, and now, and now the other one that I'm probably gonna see a lot of X's on. Does anybody know what I-Q-I-Y-I, I-Q-I or i -Q -I? <laughs> No, no, I'm seeing a lot of no's. Oh, no, no, I think, I think Tamara's just had a yes the whole time, actually. <laughs> um, I'm seeing a lot of no's. Okay, so this is a Chinese video site spun off of Baidu. Um, it has a market capitalization, allegedly, of $109 billion. Um, currently, it's on a three-quarter streak of negative earnings per share. So, honestly, who knows, who knows what we're going to see um, uh, this week. Actually, I think, they may, I think um, tomorrow um, is when they announce their earnings. So, yep, just some... Uh, just some large companies doing their earnings announcements this week that I thought were interesting. Some, some well-known, uh, some not so well-known. Um, anybody, anybody have any, uh, any questions, comments? TJ? Yeah, quick question. I believe this is the biggest competitor to Netflix, right? Um, that may be true. Um, I do not, I don't have that info. Um, okay. But yeah, it's, it's, it's always pretty interesting to see like, like, cause it, it, it's almost like China has their own internet and their own large companies. So it's yeah. like, you have, you have an American company, Amazon, and they've got Alibaba, you've got yeah. Google, Baidu, YouTube, or- Yeah, Fliggy. Yeah, sure. Just yeah, so I, I was I was just thinking that there's a comparison between uh, uh, IQ, I, YI, Netflix, and Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. For that, it's a good comparison. Yep. So that's uh, that's all I have, and I think that may be all we have. Okay. Anybody else have anything they'd like to add or or discuss before we talk about a couple stories I picked up this week? Okay, a um, couple of things that Matt just touched on here. 
originally the expectation was that Home Depot and Lowe's were going to have pretty bad results because interest rates have gone up, people aren't spending as much on their homes. Now the interest rates have sort of steady, gotten gone down and, and steadied. So now they're thinking that it may be a decent uh, a quarter for Home Depot after all. TJ Maxx will be an interesting one because it's TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Home Goods. There's something else in there too. And uh, uh, retail in general has been down. But in the last couple of quarters, the discount retailers have really sort of driven retail. And uh, so it may end up better than expected. And speaking of retail, Walmart was big. Uh, there, let me make sure I tell you the number correctly because I'm, I looked at it and I was shocked when I saw it. Um, yeah, Walmart's uh, e-commerce went up 43% and they're predicting it'll go up over 30%, 35% I think next quarter. So they have really made great um, entree into the online market. They're also doing pretty well with their grocery shopping, their online grocery shopping. The, uh, although retail was down, Walmart was up and they're, they're holding fast on, on their pretty aggressive growth strategy and uh, growth earnings numbers for next quarter. So the expectation is that earnings, uh, that Walmart has taken some market share away from some competitors. So people are high-fiving over, at, uh, over in uh, Arkansas right now about Walmart's results, it was big. Another one I want to mention to you is the budget deficit. It used to be 10 years ago, we used to talk about the size of the budget deficit all the time. There were budget clocks all over the place talking about what the size of the deficit was. And I think it just passed uh, 12 trillion, 22 trillion, a lot. It was a, it was a huge number. And we don't talk about the deficit in the same way we used to. The reason being is that we have shifted uh, our monetary policy. It used to be when the government was utilizing a lot of the debt capacity in the US that would cause interest rates to go up and it would tighten credit for companies. Well, we, uh, we, we have um, decoupled the debt supply with interest rates. We manage the interest rates now. And so as a result, the size of the deficit is less of an important factor than it used to be. And so they're saying, ah, you know, let's not worry about the deficit. I was surprised it hit a record number and it was really sort of a no big deal. And that's why it's, it's just not impacting the, uh, deficit, the uh, interest rates and the economy in general like it used to. So that one, a couple other stories I want to talk about. Um, deficit I did, did that one. Talked about Walmart. Oh, uh, you know, we, we had been expecting we're headed into a recession. Quite the opposite now. So that whole 20% drop we had in the market in December has come back. And think about it. It's come back in about six weeks' time. If we annualize that growth, it's, in, it's phenomenal. I mean, the market's done extraordinarily well. The expectation is it'll slow down and it's not going to continue to go growing at these crazy levels. But interest rates have come down. The Fed has backed off its uh, push to keep it increasing interest rates. Inflation is low, and that's big, because often if interest rates are low, inflation starts to creep up. The one issue that they're a little bit concerned about, oh, and trade pressures are better, that the, the global environment seems a little bit better, even though, as Mike noted, uh, China is, uh, is struggling a little bit um, economically at the moment. But while all of this is going on, we're also seeing that, um, completely lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? Oh, uh, while interest rates are low, we have record low unemployment. With record low unemployment, typically we start to see wages go up. We really haven't much. They've gone up slightly, but not, not enough. Companies are going to have to start paying more in order to attract employees and they can only hold and, and bear those costs for some so long then they start passing on the costs, and that's when we start seeing inflation come up so keep an eye on inflation over the course of the next quarter and see if we start to see it creeping up at three three and a half percent where i think you'll start to see um, a, a little bit more of a of a steadying off of the the uh, stock market at the moment it's it's doing quite well uh, let's see. Okay, then I had a couple of notes I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, if you would, I'm going to remember tonight, go ahead and do the uh, peer evaluation survey on your classmates so I can provide them that feedback. And I'm going to mention a couple of things to you. Uh, if you look at the syllabus, you'll see that the Rosetta case is due on March 20th. That's still a ways away, but you're ready to start doing that case. Rosetta is in two pieces. The first piece that's due on March 20th is a written case analysis. 
So if you go to our Moodle page, you'll see where it says Rosetta, and the Rosetta case is posted there. You don't have to buy it. You just open it up, and then there's a link with the questions that I want you to address. For case analysis, I expect it to be well written. I expect it to be concise. Uh, um, three to five pages is pretty much what I'm expecting. If you have appendices or graphics or something, that can be in addition to the three to five pages, but no more than three to five pages of analysis. Uh, if you have any questions, ask me. But for March 20th, it's an individual deliverable. It's due by noon on March 20th. And then after that, we're going to bring in one or more of the executives from Rosetta to talk. And then you're going to do a team-based project that's due at the end of the semester. Is there any questions about Rosetta or what the expectations are? Looks like we're okay on Rosetta. Okay, so that's that one. Now, next week, we are asynchronously online. So anything we don't finish up in chapter six, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do a recording on that. I, I think we, we're gonna knock out most of chapter six tonight. And then the rest of it, it's chapter nine. It's, it's a relatively easy chapter. It's the different types of calculations we do to assess projects. And so it's NPV, which you learned how to do last time and we're gonna do a little bit more of this time. It's internal rate of return, which is an easy formula and uh, uh, profitability index, a couple of other indices. So that's next week and it's asynchronous. Now we do have a review of the week and it's being done by Maddie, TJ and Tamara. And so between now and next Wednesday at noon, they're going to create a video of the news. So sometime, I'm guessing over the weekend or, or Monday or Tuesday, they'll go into Zoom, create a video of what's happening in the market and send it to me. I'll then post it and along with their video, they're going to include questions. We're gonna go in and do a threaded discussion and respond to their questions. Everybody needs to respond a minimum of two times between Wednesday and Monday. And believe me, I'll send you an email with all of this. And then they, they will continue to respond and interact with you all um, through our threaded discussion. And then we'll have one more opportunity for you to provide some feedback. Okay, so all of the uh, review of the week will occur. It's just all going to happen asynchronously next time. Now I'm around all of next week. Uh, I, I just, I think it's important to do a couple of asynchronous sessions and this is a good one to, uh, to cover asynchronously. All right, those were all my announcements. Do you guys have any? Oh, and then the next week I think is spring break. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I'll see you in person on March 13th and that's the next time that we have class at this time. So next week it's asynchronous. I'm gonna post it tonight so you can go in and do chapter nine at any point in time that you'd like. The homework on, on chapter nine is not due for a while. Um, I technically don't have homework on chapter nine because seven, eight, and 10 together are all components of chapter nine. So uh, there's not a specific homework for that chapter. But uh, everything will be posted tonight. You can go in and, and work your way through the problems at any point in time. The only other thing that you'll be responsible for is to make sure once the recording for the review of the week is posted that you go in and comment a couple of times and, and follow the discussion. And then we're on spring break the week of March 6th. So we'll be back together in person on March the 13th. Oh gosh, I see all kinds of questions now. Let's see. Uh, Natalie, let's start with you. Um, I just wanted to double check the three to five pages for the analysis. Is that double spaced or single spaced? It's, uh, it's double spaced uh, 12 font. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tamara? Okay, Tamara's trying to get her mic on, TJ? I believe that we have presentation due on March 13th and that's face-to-face. Uh, -face. Oh, really? You think it's on March 13th? Uh, it is, yes. I just checked. It is, oh, okay, so we don't yeah. have one next week. That's my, my question too. It's for March 13th for our team. It's, it's March 13th. Okay. Sorry. I didn't look at the date. I just noticed you were the next one. Uh, okay. Well, let me look. I'll probably do something about the markets and post it. Yeah. So you'll have a video that I'll send out next week. I'll do, I'll do a quick update on the markets, send some, send an, uh, a video out and have you respond to a few questions as well. So watch for that. It just will be me instead of, uh, Tamara, TJ, and Maddie. No wonder all three of you put those hands up so fast. What in the world is she talking about? Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions about Rosetta? Let's see, Tamara. Natalie, are your hands still up from earlier? I'm guessing so. 
Tamara, your hand is still up from earlier. Uh, I think that's everything. All right, let's go and take a look at chapter six. Get this page first. Okay, this is where we left off last time. Blow up for you there. It goes. Okay, we're going to talk about loans. And frankly, I don't think loans are all that important. Uh, I think it's more of an accounting uh, issue. But I want to make sure you know the difference between the different types of loans and see what an amortization table looks like. If you have a mortgage, you've probably seen one before. But there's really two types of loan. Um, an amortized loan that is a fixed principal payment plus interest is typically a government or um, is a company kind of loan, whereas they pay more in the early years and less later on. So here we have a loan that's a $50,000 loan. It's 10 years, has an 8% interest rate, and they have to pay $5,000 per year plus the interest expense they, they owe. So what does that look like? It's like this. Let me come in here. All is good until I come back and here it is. Let's make sure I blow this up big enough so you guys can see it. Okay, so for this one, the the payments, I'm gonna take this thing a little bit. So they're gonna pay five thousand dollars every year over the course of the 10 years in in, in uh, principal repayment. That's set. However, their interest is going to vary through time. It's 8% of, of the remaining principal balance. So initially in year one, the balance is $50,000. It's ugly. 8% of $50,000 is $4,000. So the total amount that they're going to pay in year one is $9,000. At the end of year one, they have reduced the principal amount to $45,000. So they started at 50,000, they paid down 5,000. For a principal, uh, so for a fixed principal plus interest loan, the loan will, the loan's principal will reduce by the same amount every time. So they started out with 50,000, they have to pay down 5,000 of that. That means the loan balance is at 45,000. So for the next year, what do they have? They still have that $5,000 principal, but now they only owe 45,000. So 45,000 times 8% means that their interest payment is 3,600. So their total payment is the 5,000 plus the 3,600 or $8,600. Okay, they've paid 5,000 more off, so they're down to 40,000. They're still gonna pay the 5,000 principal. 8% of 40,000 is 3,200. So their payment has dropped to 8,200 in the second year. And and so you get a sense for how this how this moves through. So in essence, what we have is we have the exact same dollar amount through time, interest payment declines through time, um, and our total payment goes down through time. The reason people don't do this is this is really hard to budget. You've got to have a lot more capacity to pay for the loan up front, and then later on your loan your your repayment amount gets smaller. By the last year, first year they pay nine thousand. By the last year they pay fifty four hundred. Companies do this all the time. Individuals, not so much. What we tend to do, pop over there so I can show you that. Instead, this is that. I also included a slide with that whole problem. Instead, this is what we do. We do an amortized loan. So the payment covers the interest expense, plus we reduce the principal through time. So if you, if you look at your mortgage and you're paying a 30-year mortgage, those early payments, you're reducing your principal by very, very little. And most of the payment is interest. And over time, that shifts so that by the end, you're mainly paying, repaying principal. So take a minute and do this problem. I'm not going to put you in your, in your rooms, but just think about this. You've got a four-year loan with annual payments. The interest rate is 8% and the principal amount is 5,000. What's the size of your annual payment? So when you have that, if you would raise your hand. I'm going to pop over to where I've got the Excel, so we'll be ready for that.
So it was a four year loan. $5,000 is how much you were borrowing. The interest rate was 8%. So what's the size of your payment? Raise your hand when you have an answer. Those hands are not flying up. Could you go back to the problem one more time? Yeah, it's a thought, it's, you're borrowing $5,000. You're going to pay it back over four years and your interest rate is 8%. You want to know how much your payment is going to be each year. Borrowing $5,000, you're gonna repay in four years. 8% interest. Matt H., what's your payment? Oh, sorry, you said you said $5,000? 5,000, yes. Oh, 5,000. Oh, payment is uh, $1,509.60. Good. Okay, so let's see how Matt did that. In essence, what he did is he, he's, he did the payment formula. So it equals payment, and then it wants to know the rate of 8%. The number of periods is four. The present value is 5,000. How much we're borrowing? We don't have a future value or a type. So the, the a payment would be 1509. Okay, this makes sense for us. We can pay the exact same dollar amount through time. But look at what occurs. So we borrowed $5,000. We're paying 1509. 8% of 5,000 means 400 is how much interest we're paying initially. So the rest, 5,000 minus the difference between 1509 and 400, or 1109 is the amount of the payment that's going towards reducing our principal. So our principal goes down to 3890. The next year we still pay 1509 and we pay interest on this 3890 and the interest is 311. 311.23. Well, the difference between the 1509 payment that we're making and the 311 is right about $1,200. That's how much our principal is reduced by. So by the end of the second year, our principal is down to 2692. We're going to make that same 1509 payment. 8% of that is 215. So 215 subtracted from that 1509 is about $1,300. So what we still owe is just under 1400 We pay 1509 111 of that is interest, 8% of the uh, 1397 that we owe. And at the end, we essentially have, have reduced our balance down to zero. So that's, that's the way that you and I tend to, to have loan payments. Uh, again, I, don't, I personally would never ask you to do a loan payment problem. Um, because it's not really finance to me, it's more accounting, but the book goes through it. And so uh, the fact that there's a payment involved, you now know, you now can say you know how to do that. I went through and I did this, oh, and I'm gonna post these. I went through and did every one um, in a narrative form so that you'd have the ability to look back at it later on too. So that's all in here. Okay, I want you to take a look at this problem. So we have four years of cash flows, discounts rate 7%. Um, so what I want you to calculate is the present value of the cash flows, presuming the discount rate first is 7%, then what if it were 17%, and then what if it were 25%. So take a minute to write down that problem. I am going to go ahead and pop you in your rooms for a minute so you have a chance to, uh, to talk to each other about, about this problem. So where is we going to put in? Okay, so your rooms are open. As soon as you've had a chance to write down the problem, pop in your room, do the three present value calculations, and then I'll pull you back in together in just a second. Do I have to click something to get into a room?
Um, yeah, you should have seen where it appeared that it's, it, it said join the room. Um, you see that? I do. Well, I don't think you can right now because everybody's coming back in, but you should have seen something that said join room. All right, they'll be back in in just a, just a couple of seconds. Okay, Brian, tell us how you did this. <clears throat> um, okay, so I did the net present value for each of those percentages with those payments in it. So you would do equals NPV and then each of the rates and then each value would be each of the payment values. Okay, and what did you get? Um, for 7%, 396.98. For 17, 3110.05. And for 25, 263.96. Okay, good. So what, what Brian did is he said equals a net present value because that will allow you to pull down the entire rate, the entire row of, uh, of numbers at the same time. You put in the rate first, comma, and then you put in, remember with NPV, we only do years one, we only do years one through forever, however long it lasts. We do not include year zero. And, and the parentheses, and it came up to be 39.26. Now watch that number right there. So I could have just come in here and changed the 7% to 17%. And, oops. <laughs> And the answer would have adjusted. I could have changed it then to 25% and the number would adjust again. So by changing that cell, given that we grab that cell, it will allow us to just go ahead and, and do a, a, a quick recalculation. Does anybody have any questions on that one? No questions? Okay, I'm gonna have you do one last one because we had a reasonable break tonight. So let me have you do this last problem and we will have officially finished chapter six. I included, I'll post these shortly. I included if you work these out as a, a present value one by one, so you could see what that looks like as well. And then I also showed the calculator solutions just in case you wanted to use the calculator. So here we have an investment that's uh, $5,100 per year for 10 years. First, the payment occurs a year from now. Required rate is 5%. What's the investment going to be worth today? And then what if it was going for instead of 10 years for 35 years? And instead of 35 years, what if it went for 65 years? So I want you to go into your breakout rooms quickly, work this problem, and then come on back in. We'll check it, and we will wrap up for the night. Uh, breakout rooms should be open once you've written down the problem, if you don't have it. 